Hello folks, welcome to the Epochs of the Lotus Eaters, episode 71, Edward the Confessor. I'm joined by Bo, and we'll be talking about, uh, well, the last like proper Anglo-Saxon king, really, isn't he? Yeah, it's the end of the House of Wessex, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I mean, you can say Godwin and his son, Harold Godwinson, are, well, they're not Danes and they're not Normans, but... They lasted like six months. They're not the House of Alfred. No. Which... But they also didn't. Is. They didn't last very long, anyway. So it's like, yeah. you, know, they, they, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say that Godwinson had a reign, as it were. You know. Well, yeah, very short one, but yeah, yeah. we'll get into that next time, though. We will. Yeah, we're going to we take will. this up to the death of the confessor. Yeah, and leave it there because the events directly after that are, of course, momentous. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much so. Yeah. Right. So we we left last time uh, the Anglo-Saxon Game of Thrones with all of the actual uh, competitors, sort of dead or out of the picture and it's just basically edward left the mm. bookish like unlikely winner of this last man standing yeah. really yeah because he had when you look back at it um his older brothers and half brothers there were loads of them ethel red um had like what was it six sons or something before yeah. he ever married edmer <laughs> emma of normandy yeah. they're all gone he had his older brother and anyway there was just loads of other people ahead loads of the confessor and they're they're all gone so it's the last man standing and as a lot of people probably know he was um he didn't sire any children himself mm. so he's he really is sort of the last the last gasp mm. the last scion of that house of wessex um so it's a a little bit sad if you're rooting for the anglo-saxons the, the the ancient house of wessex it is quite sad really yeah Okay, so where do we where do we begin? All right, so I just wanted to refresh people's memories about the event where uh, Edward the Confessor's brother Alfred went across to England and had been murdered by yeah. uh, nominally uh, Harold Harefoot, hmm. but actually on the orders of Godwin and Godwin's men. Um, so must bear that in mind because it's sort of it's a key thing. Hmm. Um, Okay, so we can get into it. If uh, mm. I could talk a little bit in general terms then about the confessor before we get into the details and the chronology of all the events, yeah. Um, because he's one of those people um, that that is, you know, he's quite famous, isn't he? Really, Edward oh, confessor. Yeah. Everyone that knows the, the the story of the conquest, which uh, Americans might not be as familiar, but anyone who's English, you're sort of brought up with it, aren't you? Well, in previous eras, you were. Oh uh, yeah, perhaps yeah. not now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but in normal times. Yeah before we were being subverted, uh, any English child would be brought up with some understanding mm. of the knowledge of it. And he exists in that story as an old man. Mm. But of course, he wasn't always an old man. Um, so there's much more to him. So first to sort of uh, dispel that or to come to terms with that, that, mm. um, it, you know, he wasn't just this white-haired, old, pious no, no. chap. He was, there's more to him. So I've um, got one paragraph from, from Churchill, and then I've got another one from Nicholas Vincent, if I can read those. Yeah, yeah. And um, and we'll set the scene. Churchill said, uh, quote, Edward was a quiet, pious person uh, without liking for war or much aptitude for administration. His Norman upbringing made him the willing, uh, though gentle agent of Norman influence uh, so far as Earl Godwin would allow. We'll get into that because mm -hmm. he was um, his personal power ebbed and flowed over the years. Um, Norman prelates appeared in the English church, Norman clerks in the royal household, and Norm Norman landowners in the English shires. To make all smooth, Edward was obliged to marry Godwin's young and handsome daughter, but we are assured by contemporary writers that the union was no more than formal. According to tradition, the king was a kindly, weak, chubby albino. Not everyone says that about the Albino. No, I no, I didn't know about that. Yeah. Well, one of the things, just to quickly say on that, is that in the Bayeux Tapestry, where he's depicted, hmm. he's shown as white haired, white bearded, and pale. Sort of his, his skin is coloured in. Right. Maybe, yeah. yeah. But maybe it's because um, he's albino, yeah. But Churchill just says, just states it as a, just a statement of fact. He hmm. was an albino. Anyway, um, some later writers profess uh, to discern uh, a latent energy in a few of his dealings with a formidable group of Anglo-Danish warriors that surrounded him. Nevertheless, his main interest in life was religious, and as he grew older, his outlook was increasingly that of a monk. In these harsh times, he played much the same part as Henry VI, whose nature was similar during the Wars of the Roses. His saintliness brought him, as the years passed by, a reward in veneration of his people, who forgave him his weakness for the sake of his virtues. 
So that's sort of your, your general purpose, common knowledge mm. view of the confessor. But there's more to him. Nicholas Vincent wrote, Edward has gone down in history as the confessor, a milky white, long fingered and semi translucent embodiment of everything most saintly. An old man famed for piety and chastity rather than for worldly strength. Yet his reputation comes to us only from the later years of Edward's reign, and in particular from the period after his death, when historians were seeking an explanation for recent cataclysmic events, i.e. the conquest. Yeah. Um, in his lifetime, certainly through the 1050s, Edward was a more forceful and commanding figure, famed as much for his rages as for his piety, keen on hunting, a jealous accumulator of wealth and precious objects, a patron of the military, not merely of the church. Edward's one prevailing problem was his, was his indebtedness to Earl Godwin. Without Godwin, he might never have negotiated his return to England, and yet Edward clearly resented not only Godwin's role in the death of his brother Alfred, but the extraordinary degree to which, over a period of 30 years, Godwin, Godwin had risen from virtually nothing to establish landed wealth and a military authority, rivaling not, not just that of his fellow earl, earls, but the king himself. Like many princes who come to the throne relatively late in life, Edward was at least 38 by the time of his accession, a sense of uh, resentment may have sounded as the keynote of his life. He clearly resented his mother, <coughs> who abandoned him in childhood to marry his father's usurper, Canute of Denmark. So great was Edward's sense of in injury here that after 1042, Emma was immediately stripped both of power and, have, and of every considerable and of her very considerable wealth. Um, even more bitterly, Edward resented Godwin. End quote. So we'll get into all that in a sec. But there you go. So, yeah. so he's obviously he's not just this white-haired, grey old man who does nothing. Yeah. That was just the sort of the very end bit of his life. That. Right. right. So when he comes over, he's like 38, 40 odd. Um, so he's not over the hill. No, no, he's not yeah. done at all. And no. as I said, there he's vigorous. He mm. will do things. Um, mm. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, I wasn't. Uh, I'm not. I'm not very familiar with Ed, with the confessor, just as the caricature. You know, at the end of his life before the conquest. Mm. So uh, okay, well, what sort of things did he do? Uh, well, okay, so thing to mention is um, so his ebb and flow of power with Godwin. Mm. Um, so at certain points, he didn't, uh, especially most of the end of his reign, he didn't really do much at all. He wasn't really allowed to. Mm. We'll get to that. He was sort of basically, he was pretty much a complete puppet and he was sort of trotted out on state occasions. A bit like the Queen nowadays. Um, she goes where she's told to go yeah. and speaks when she's allowed to speak. He's and, given the, the speech. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but in at the beginning of his reign, well, so the key thing is that he comes over, he was invited over, wasn't he? He was mm. invited over. So he's not like a William the Conqueror or a Bolingbroke or a William of Orange. He's not, mm. he's not in that mould. Yeah. And when he came over, he just had literally a handful of followers, Norman followers. So he was never, uh, to begin with, in a position to um, do anything completely... Assert himself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and as I mentioned there, he, he, his indebtedness to Godwin. Mm. Yeah, Godwin is very much a, a kingmaker. Mm. Um, and we see there that, that he was sort of, he took Godwin's daughter, called Edith, um, as a wife. Mm. Probably didn't really have much of a say in that. Mm. Or, Doesn't seem to have been terribly interested in her either, I suppose. Uh, no. Um, yeah. No, they, they, as I say, didn't produce any children. And she said... Um, that, yeah, they never consummated the marriage. Um, it's just not interested in any of that. Um, and, uh, but people say, maybe that's just because of his piety. It might be because of other things. It might be things mm. like we don't know about. But it may just be, or pr quite possibly could be, that he didn't want to give Godwin a grandson who's going to be king. That's a fair point. He's like, S yeah. screw you. Like, yeah. you basically forced me to marry your daughter so you can yeah. have a grandson who's yeah. a legit heir. Well, yeah. how about no? <laughs> How about I'm just not going to do that? Uh, uh, how'd you like me now? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great deal um, of um, great deal of self control. Well, yeah, because um, <laughs> apparently that Edith was um, uh, very attractive. Yeah, yeah. Like the Chronicle and things say she was, mm. and that she was um, a really interesting person as well. Like another one of these women mm. who totally have their own mind and yeah. are sort of um, interesting and well read mm. and witty or whatever in mm. their own right. Um, so in the normal course of events, it would have been a good marriage. Yeah. And she was younger than him. She was only in her twenties or whatever. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, for whatever reason, and perhaps this is another time to mention the, the accounts. We've got the, uh, 
uh, the Chronicle and the Life of Edward and uh, Robert of, uh, William of Jumiège, his his brother, I think it's his brother, Robert of Jumiège, comes into it. Um, uh, Henry of Huntingdon, all sorts of people. Um, but the main one, as usual, is the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Mm -hmm. And for this sort of nearly 20-odd years, it, again, periodically seems to go very, very quiet. Mm. Like there'll be a whole year or two where it just doesn't say anything. We've got nothing. And then other times it will be, um, it will just sort of give us just a couple of lines. So, so at mm. one point, Godwin is completely out of favour and gets exiled and has to run away. Yeah. And it just like mentions a line or two of that. It's like, the, the, oh, come there's on. a bit more there. Come on, yeah, guys. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's really going yeah. on? Yeah. Um, oh well. So one of the first things to mention then is that um, that episode there, um, which Nicholas Vincent mentioned about mm. depriving his mother Emma, yeah, of uh, yeah. of her money and titles and things. Yeah, no, no more deserving. <laughs> I don't yeah. like Emma of Normandy. You're not much. a fan, not really. She... <laughs> <laughs> uh, like again, like the Cersei Lannisters of the world, I haven't got much sympathy for, right. to be honest. Yeah. So you know, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle calls her a serial hatcher of plots. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she's going to go down in your estimation even more now. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> I quite like her. I, I quite like to dislike her. Yeah, I'm not saying I'd um, like the character to disappear. Right, she's right. an interesting character. Yeah. But like, I'm not sympathetic to her. There are some baddies that you still like. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I view Napoleon as essentially. A baddie, oh, of course. if you like. But I still really like him. Yeah, he's still very really interesting. Like, yeah. If I'm perfectly honest with myself, Alexander's not really a goodie. <laughs> and yet and yet I'm fascinated. Love him. He's great. Getting some like, hot takes like, today. Yeah, well, there you go. I mean um, <laughs> so um here's what the actual Anglo Saxon Chronicle says. It says yeah. uh, the king went to Winchester and deprived his mother Emma of all her possessions, uh, both lands and treasure. Uh all that she owned in gold and silver and things beyond description. Um, and then later um, it says that he, that she had, she did less for him as king and before he was king. Hmm. Um, and it seems perhaps maybe, because we don't, again, we've got a few lines like that, but no massive detail of what the actual intrigue was or the details of mm. who said what to who and when exactly. We haven't got all that, so we have to infer a fair bit. But again, the, sex, the, the, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says that um, she may have been plotting with um, Magnus of Norway. Oh, forbid. Heaven forbid. <laughs> uh, Emma of Normandy plotting with a foreign king. Can't imagine it. Do you remember me saying that uh, Hartha Knut was tied up in Denmark for yeah. years and years and years, which caused that whole problem? Well, you think she might have been responsible? Oh, for no, no, no. Right. Uh, I was just going to say that he was fighting against this Magnus of Norway. Right, right, right. So Magnus of Norway is um, formidable. He's a formidable right. dude. Um, no two ways about that. And even yeah. though Hartha Knut did end up getting himself a bit of, bit of breathing space, he never defeated this Magnus, mm. killed him or anything like that. I mean, he's still around now. Yeah. In um, This is sort of the... Uh, 1042, 1043, we're talking. So mm -hmm. pretty much straight after a year, pretty much at when, as soon as the confessor comes over. Yeah. Um, just to mention again, mentioned it in the last one, but he was never called the confessor during his lifetime. No. He wasn't made a saint until the 1160s by, by one of the popes. Right. So that's a later thing. But I shall call him Edward the Confessor and things throughout this, just for ease of... It's just we, That's how we know. That, that's how all yeah. um, normal English children are raised <laughs> to call him. Yeah. Um, so... Um, um, uh, Mark Morris and Nicholas Vincent, I think, both say that um, it's not completely crazy that Emma of Normandy might have been plotting something or other with no, Magnus. No, it's not, not unrealistic. Because that's just what she did. Yeah, especially if she just had all her wealth stripped of her. She's going to be quite resentful herself. Right. Oh, no, sorry. So that the stripping of her was oh, in reaction to this. But nevertheless. Yeah, either, yeah nevertheless. Um, I can still see it being correct. Just to jump ahead ever so slightly, some say that all that might not be the case because it also seems that within a couple of years after this, by sort of the mid, late 18, uh, 1040s, she'd been basically returned to favour. Hmm. She hadn't been given all her treasures and lands back, hmm. but she certainly wasn't sort of in prison or in a nunnery no. or anything like that. She seems to have been returned to sort of the inner sanctum of power again. So whatever she did or didn't do, it couldn't have been that bad. Mm. But the Chronicle does say that she was like a traitor to her son and to the crown and things. Quite strong, really. And so what happened was, Edward Conf Confessor, uh, she was in, what did it say, in, in Winchester, which is the seat of the House of Wessex, that he 
um, basically besieges her there. He turns <laughs> up with loads of retainers. He gets right. his three main earls, yeah. most powerful earls, and turns up with like a small host, a small army. Yeah. And, uh, and like, uh, um, surprisingly, she didn't see it coming and besieges oh. her in Winchester. To be fair, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought Edward was, was capable. Right, right yeah. Okay, so. Again, it's another, yeah, flips yeah. it on the head, this idea that yeah. he's this poor, pious, saintly yeah. old, never, okay, never so say boo to a goose. Well, He's well, actually raised an army, okay. A small one, yeah. yeah. Now, people, historians have argued um, that some have said um, that he resented her so much that all he ever wanted to do is just waiting for his moment to screw her over <laughs> and get her out of the picture. <laughs> right, yeah. And so this was sort of um, a sort of a, a cold dish of revenge. Yeah. Like you abandoned me and Alfred as boys. Yeah, yeah. And you've did, done yeah. X, Y, and Z, and da, 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 and now I'm going to get you back. And other historians have said no. This whole episode smacks of um, a, a reaction, a knee jerk reaction to mm. events very quickly unfolding. Um, mm. It can make your own mind up about that. I actually think the latter a bit. Um, because it does seem like he, it seems like he was yeah reacting to something. It's not something he planned for ages. Yeah, but there there has to be some sort of resentment there because oh, I mean she did so. you know like you say abandon them. Swans off for twenty years or something, and then after all of her plans come to naught, has to fall back on Alfred, who then gets murdered, and then eventually him. You know, so he must have been like, oh, you know that that's how this is, is it. You know, after everything else has failed, it comes back to me, does it? You know, I'm the last choice for yeah. you. I'm yeah, the yeah. last chance for you. And, like, yeah, God, we can't have been a happy chappy about it. Yeah. No, absolutely. There's, must, there's no way there wasn't some in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of your last choice. I'm your last choice. Obviously. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, one small thing to mention is whether Alfred or Edward the Confessor, who's older, the histories definitely disagree. Really? They mostly say Alfred was the older brother, mm. but one of them I was reading just now, they said Alfred was the younger brother of the two. So anyway, it's a tiny point. Yeah. Um, and uh, the fact that he, after all of that, that she may have still sort of preferred the um, uh, to go with a king of Norway over him. It's still like it's a it's a slap in the face, isn't it? She she is awful. It's a isn't real she? slap in the face. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that is one of that is basically her last sort of big um uh big set of events on the stage right. of history after this she sort of disappears into obscurity a bit oh, and she lives God. for a few more years but eventually just dies of old age right um but she well, i mean what a life she had i mean oh, going back to 1002 when she first married ethelred yeah so it's certainly been busy yeah you know she certainly had a lot to do yeah yeah um, okay so uh Edward's besieging her in Winchester. Yeah. Well, successfully. Right. Like I say, de uh, de dispossesses her of all her money. Mm -hmm. Gold and silver and things beyond description. <laughs> um, it's a lazy okay. way out, isn't it? So, ah, it's just beyond description. <laughs> yeah, I suppose, yeah. Um, so the next sort of um, main events mm. are that um, he's be well, begins his struggle with Earl Godwin. Mm. Um uh, Nicholas Vincent describes Godwin and his family as the preeminent godfather of English families. Yeah. It's, he calls him uh, that his family were earls on paper, but the real power behind the throne. Yeah. Um, and, and that's become obvious by this point. Yeah. Like, it's, like you know, the fact that Godwin keeps coming up yeah, is a bit sus. It seems that, um, well, it does say it is, it's certainly the case that um, he was sort of easily the most powerful um, person under the king himself. And in mm. fact, his military power, his ability to raise men, mm. far outstripped Edward the Confessor. Like I say, Edward Confessor mm. had a few Norman retainers, yeah, but he couldn't just raise a whole army's worth of men, mm. whereas Godwin could. So that right there, just that alone, is, well, the power lies with him, doesn't yeah. it? Because yeah. the ultimate power is who can... Who can, who can command the army. Yeah, right. Um, and so, sort of Godwin knows this. He knows his own hand. Mm. He knows sort of how powerful he is. Um, and so he does sort of treat um, the confessor, um, well, he treats him well, but, sure, but doesn't but also, allow him 
to just con- a set policy yeah. and things. Yeah. So, for example, one of the, one of the things that gets mentioned is um, the church, ecclesiastical mm-hmm. affairs. Um, and one of the, the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, dies and uh, Godwin says, okay, I want, I want this guy to be the next one. And Edward Confessor um, sort of puts his foot down and says, no, I want my guy, mm. uh, William of Jumiège. Who is so obviously, Norman. yeah, Norman, yeah. Um, and so Godwin uh, like doesn't actually sort of veto it or launch a civil war to prevent it, but it's like, hmm. like so, who do you think you are? So who do you think? <laughs> what do you think is going on here? You're not trying to be king, really, are you? Like, come on, be serious. Yeah, but he sort of allows that to slide, or you know, doesn't make it mm. uh, the hill to die on. Um, uh, but then I suppose, again, we can only really infer it because the, the life of Edward in the Chronicle doesn't tell us explicitly. But you can only suppose that that sort of gave the confessor um, a bit of wind in his sails. Because mm. what he starts doing is replacing a lot of the top jobs with his Norman friends. Yeah, I was just thinking this. Like you, you can already see the sort of Norman influence over England because of his time in Normandy. And so... Like often it's presented as if William the Conqueror is just this random thunderbolt from the blue. Just turns up and says, like, oh God, there's, a, there's a, a Norman with a, an army and he's taken over. Oh God. But it's actually not nearly as cut and dried as that, is it? Yeah. Like there's, you know, there's a great deal of, um, there are sinews between England and Normandy, Normandy right from the beginning of this century. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's, it's old, you know? Mm. I do think it's a very, very, very poor, or just simply incorrect view hmm. that some people have um, that William the Bastard, William Duke of Normandy, who comes over yeah. and conquers England in 1066, that he's sort of a bolt from the blue. Yeah. Well, that's, or, that's the way it's presented. It know? often is, yeah. yeah. And it's just, it's really the opposite of what's yeah. true, really. Hmm. Um, the, the fact that these sort of completely foreign strangers from France come over and take illegally... Mm. But I mean, I suppose it is illegal still, but it is a usurpation still. But they, they like I say, a bolt from the blue. Well, it's, it's not a bolt from the blue. It, it starts. It's just not. It starts lending credence to the idea that actually Harold Godwinson was kind of a usurper, doesn't it? Uh, that's the thing. It, like, it's it's actually not as cut and dried as you think. So, well, so what I would say is that obviously William Duke of Normandy has got no official. Uh, he's got no claim to the House yeah. of Wessex or the throne of England whatsoever. Mm. Um, but neither is Godwinson. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah. Godwinson comes from, his father Godwin yeah. came from basically nothing. Yeah. So although they might be more Anglo than they are, more Anglo-Saxon than mm. Duke William, um, they've got no, they've got no royal blood in mm. their veins whatsoever. Not that William has either. Well, the, house, the house of Wessex is over with conf- yeah. the confessor, isn't it? That's right. So now it's about, okay, well, who's next? And these, both of these like great houses are invested in English politics. Yeah, you know, yeah, whether you yeah, like it or not. Absolutely, no, big time. And I think I said it, I did say it in one of the previous ones, but again, quite often when you just look at the conquest, people say, oh, on the field in October 1066, um, the, like the, the, the cream of Anglo-Saxon aristocracy was, was killed on that field. Mm. Not really, because they were some sort of replacement mm. set of Anglo-Saxon mm. nobles the sort of original ones, the real ones, were killed back in sort of 10, 16 times. Yeah, yeah. Um, so again, it's just sort of a, f- a relatively low resolution view mm. to say that there's like this unbroken set of Anglo-Saxon nobles that mm. were all killed in 1066. Yeah, they were actually replacement usurper types. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah, you could go back to the Battle of Malden, 991, yeah, yeah, is it? Yeah. And say that the, the proper, proper ones, the legit ones, were a lot of them died there. But, yeah. but even then, I don't, I don't think these battles are quite big enough to be the cataclysm that they're portrayed as either. Because, I mean, we know that a lot of the Anglo-Saxon nobility flees to the court of the Byzantines, right? It's like, well, where are all mm. these men coming from, yeah. you know? And, at, you know, at the end of the day, don't get me wrong, like 10,000 men at Hastings or, you know, 3,000 men at Malden or whatever it is. I mean, that's that's large-ish numbers, but not very large, you know, considering that England's probably like 2 million people. At this point, you know, so it's like, you know, ish, you mm. know, it, it, don't get me wrong, it's not pleasant or anything, but it's not the end mm. of the world. And it's, I, I, I think these are all often overstated, mm. frankly. 
Yeah, no, it's a fair point. Yeah, no, it's absolutely a fair point. I think in later epochs, we def- I'm definitely going to spend a few minutes at least talking about the Varangian Guard. And oh, the, yeah, yeah. Um, just, very, just very, very quickly on that, I was reading something, going ahead, getting my head myself, talking about how um, there was some sort of actual English enclave in Constantinople, mm. and they called it New England or something. Mm. So, again, hundreds and hundreds of years before the New England in the New World in America. Yeah. Hundreds and hundreds of years before any other <laughs> We were sort already colonising the Byzantines. Bit before, um, <laughs> yeah, before Hawkins and Drake yeah. and anything like that. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. There was some sort of proto-English enclave in, in Constantinople. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, if I could read a couple of quick paragraphs from uh, Mark Morris's great book, The Anglo-Saxons. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a general one here, um, talking about the confessor. Uh, his posthumous sanctity, however, should not mislead us into thinking uh, he, he was unconcerned with secular affairs, or that he had no aptitude for the more muscular aspects of kingship. Pious though he may have been, um, uh, pious uh, he may have been, but the confessor was neither a pacifist nor a pushover. In the second year of his reign, for instance, he responded vigorously to reports that his mother was plotting against him, riding with his earls and their military retinues to Winchester and depriving the former queen of all her property. Similarly, in 1044, and also in the year that followed, Edward reacted to threats of an imminent invasion from Norway by assembling ships at Sandwich and sailing out into the Channel, ready to fend off any attack. Hmm. Okay, well, good for him. So that's the next thing. Again, still this Magnus. Mm. Um, there was there was there was rumblings afoot that mm. he was going to invade Britain. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.